going on, Knicks fans? How you doing? I'm Jeremy, and here with another episode of Cap Rules Everything Around Me. Cream, get the money, dollar dollar bills, y'all. It's good to be back as Andrew and John, John and Andrew, whatever mixture we want to say it, um, mentioned on the most recent pod, I was still feeling under the weather. If you were listening to me last week, then you'd know how sick I sounded and uh, turned out to be COVID. Yeah, a lot of fun stuff. Was uh, pretty miserable. Really, really awful. One of the worst colds I've ever had. And I'm just fortunate that I was vaccinated and boosted. So um, stay safe. I didn't even get it from a restaurant. I got it from my roommate in my own home. So uh, it can get you in a lot of ways. But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about instead the salary cap, the NBA landscape, free agency, all sorts of good stuff. So one of the things that I saw this past week that I thought was kind of interesting, we're going to talk about the devil. We're going to talk about Pat Riley. He talked about how the Heat are in a position where they need to take the next step forward. Now, the Knicks and the Heat, for full disclosure, have not made a trade with one another since Pat Riley went to Miami. Yes, that trade, because it was a trade, involved Pat Riley, and he has not involved the Knicks at all since then. So I don't foresee any Knicks heat trades occurring. With that said, I'm just curious about some of the things that were said in his press conference, specifically how he wants to upgrade the team, but he also wants to keep P.J. Tucker. And he's going to talk about or talk to Kyle Lowry about everything that is resorted with his body weight. Um, you know, Kyle Lowry is at a later stage in his career. Um, he's he's a, a really good player. A uh, um, little problem, perhaps, with the body weight index or the BMI, I guess, even though body weight index does not go to BMI in terms of body fat percentage, whatever you want to call it, really. The thing with that is it's fascinating to me because there are basically two ways for the Heat to upgrade as a team. And it's, I mean, they need to trade for a star to really get them over the hump. That's my opinion. How would they do that? Well, number one would be trading Kyle Lowry. The thing is Kyle Lowry has an incredible hold on the team's locker room. There was a report that before the playoffs started, the Heat went down to the Caribbean and they, it said there was some veteran that they really respect who brought them down there. And the thoughts were, was it Jimmy Butler? Was it Jonas Haslam? It turned out it was Kyle Lowry's idea. And he's just a big presence in their locker room. But then if they don't trade Lowry, then the math involved to get someone like Bradley Beal. It's Duncan Robinson, who was buried in the rotation in the playoffs. Tyler Harrow and PJ Tucker. That's how they get there. Cause they're not going to trade Bam Adebayo. They're not trading Jimmy Butler and they don't have a lot of other salary to go around that makes it worthwhile. So on one hand, it sounds like Pat Riley wants to keep Kyle Lowry. On the other hand, it sounds like he wants to keep PJ Tucker. If they want to make a move, one of those players is going to be gone. It's just a question of which one, obviously if you're bringing in someone like, again, it's just an example, but someone like Bradley Beal, you're not going to necessarily want to have Kyle Lowry still there, but you could also make the case of, well, maybe they instead don't want Tyler Harrow there and they can move some pieces around where maybe get some creation off the bench with Oladipo. They can keep him that sort of thing. So a lot of different movements that they can make. It's just, it's an interesting business because what Pat Riley's saying, and, and I thought it was using how he said that we want to keep PJ Tucker didn't sound exactly like we want to keep Kyle Lowry, but we know that he's respected and they, I mean, he, he just got there a year ago. So it'll be fascinating to see what they do just from a basketball standpoint. I'm very curious, but other than that, not a whole lot going on. Um, this is still like, especially quiet, which is frustrating because I feel like when it becomes really quiet, the discourse for a lot of these conversations just goes off the rails because people are really eager to talk about things and that's great 
but then they talk about things that are just like out of the realm of possibility or potentially just ludicrous. And I, again, I can't fault them. There's not much going on. We, we want to talk about something. I'm at the point now. I think it hit me today that I really need it to be the draft because I'm, I'm so tired of trying to figure out possibilities. I'm happy to do this. I love doing this. If anything, like this is the one thing that, it takes me out of quarantine that I love about it. Um, it's the other stuff that's just like, ah, but we'll get through it. We're going to get through it. And we got one question going on first. Uh, Mino F. Thank you, Mino. Uh, if Johnny Bryant was offered the Utah job, do you think the Knicks would move on from Tibbs to keep Bryant? I don't. I think that they are comfortable with Tibbs leading the team right now. I really like Johnny Bryant. The player development is evident. I also don't believe he's the only person responsible for the development of the players or that he's not to a degree replaceable. With that said, I would love to have Johnny Bryant stay here. If it doesn't work out with Tibbs, and again, I've talked about how I don't see it realistically long-term working out, you would hope to have him there. But the other thing is that I think it's that we as fans have to also remember there aren't two coaches in the NBA. There aren't just Tom Thibodeau and Johnny Bryant. The Knicks interviewed a large amount of coaches. I mean, look how many coaches are just applying for the Utah job. And I don't even think it's that great of a job, but it's one of the 30 that's available. So, of course, there can be people who are interested. But it seems like every couple hours I get notified about Shams or Woj uh, saying like, hey, there's a new candidate or two new candidates. It's just a large pool of applicants. And you can find good talent out there. So as much as we want the Knicks to retain Johnny Bryant and be the next guy, assuming Tibbs is not here long term, there are other really qualified candidates out there. So, look, if I were in charge, yes, I'd probably turn over from Tibbs because I know that he that Johnny Bryant is beloved by the team. I'm, I know that Tibbs is liked. He's well received. I don't know if it's quite the same um, just based on secondhand reports. But at the same time, there are other really good associates and if and, and head coaches or associate and assistant coaches out there, associate and assistant coaches. And I think another way of looking at it is the Knicks have so far had two coaches, Mike Woodson and Kenny Payne, be poached for their dream jobs. If Johnny Bryant goes, that would make a third. That would mean that the Knicks hired three men who are extremely qualified and capable and we're that's recognized and other teams or, you know, whether it's in the NBA or the NCAA believe that too. So it tells me that the Knicks have a pretty firm grasp on who is a good NBA talent level of coach and maybe who isn't. And that's the sort of thing where I want to keep Johnny Bryant, but I I'm confident in the fact that they can find other quality people to flank Tibbs. And hopefully uh, when the time comes to replace Tibbs, and then move forward that way. So that's the way I certainly see it. House Flan. Can Dallas avoid the luxury tax and re-sign Brunson? I saw an article that had their luxury tax at $85 million that almost forces their hand to sign and trade Brunson, right? We're going to talk about Brunson this upcoming week. Would have been this, week, this past week, if not for COVID. Um, I'm not bitter. Can you tell? I'm not bitter at all. So the article that House Salon is talking about is Hollinger, John Hollinger for The Athletic had an article basically saying that if Jalen Brunson were signed to a contract starting at $29 million, just want to quickly uh, stamp this one out. He's not going to get $29 million. Hollinger even says in the article by prefacing the amounts that I have aren't necessarily an exact amount of what these players are going to get. Um, Brunson's probably not going to get $29 million. In fact, I feel pretty confident that he won't get $29 million. But nevertheless, even if he did get $29 million, that would mean that the luxury tax they would have, it would probably, let's see, the Mavs about $153 million in commitments. The luxury tax, $149. $29 would bump them up from $153 to $182. So, I mean, we're talking about well over, right? That's $33 million over the tax, which is where then based on brackets and everything, um, the bracket, like the tax brackets, 
that would land them at $85 million. That's a lot. And even if you bring it down a little bit, it's still a lot. And I'm of the mindset where just to give a tiny piece away, a little, little free sample here, the Mavs are probably no matter what in tax, in, in the luxury tax, whether they're in tax hell or just paying luxury taxes is a different story. But that's the thing with Brunson where it's not that I'm skeptical that the Mavs are willing to go into the tax for him. It's how much are they willing to go into it for him? Because if they paid $85 million in taxes, that's an astounding amount. The way they would get out of it would then have to be to dump salary. So is it like, are they dumping Bertans? Are they dumping Tim Hardaway Jr.? What does it cost to dump those players? Because you have to dump them into cap space. Are the teams that have cap space willing to take them on for, you know, a pick? And mind you, the Mavs can't even trade a first round pick until 2027 because the Knicks have their 2023 pick, which is protected. And it goes till 2025 and you can't trade two future first round picks in back to back years. So you can't trade the 2026 pick. So all this is a way of saying Dallas's financial situation is a lot rougher than I think people truly realize. And I'm glad Hollinger wrote about it because now there's more of an understanding of how problematic it can be for him, for them, him being, I guess, Mark Cuban, is he willing to pay? Maybe I'll believe it when I see it. But when he was paying the tax years ago, the penalties were not nearly as steep. So we'll talk more about it obviously very soon, but yeah, Dallas is going to be in the tax no matter what, unless they keep Brunson and then offload salary. But then how does that impact their ceiling later? Because if they're trading a first round pick to dump salary, that doesn't really help them. It doesn't help them build a contender around Luka Doncic. So thank you for asking that house. That was a really good question. And it will be answered in even more depth um, in a podcast near you on Monday. Eddie F. Uh, Thank you so much for the super chat. It won't let me send $18. <laughs> so hi and to Boychuk. Thank you. Uh, glad you were better. How much are we really banking on quick at the point? Is that a serious narrative or a fallback to a fan favorite? I would say from my vantage point, it's not that the Knicks don't believe in Emmanuel quickly long-term. It's that they believe in Emmanuel quickly, but they want to bring him along a little bit slower than we as fans want to see. I think the problem is that we are so accustomed to like the, the Frank Neal, Frank Neal Aquina treatment, right? Where he was buried on the bench, didn't get a lot of playing time. And the problem was that veterans who were worse, not worse, but taking up unnecessary time were in his way. And it's a little dissimilar from what we just saw because at least like Quentin Grimes was able to rise through and make his breakthrough sort of happened with Frank, but I'm digressing because it's the sort of thing where we're just so eager for these players to jump onto the scene, but we don't really necessarily think about what goes into it where it's like, well, yeah. What if Emmanuel quickly dominates in off the bench? Like two things can be true. Um, Maybe. Emmanuel quickly isn't ready to be a full-time starter. And also the Knicks royally fucked up by not having him start last year and by giving Alec Burks as many starts as he received. Right. So it's a shame that we didn't see more of quick, but we saw at the end of the season that there's a good player there. It's something that's worthwhile and it's why the Knicks should continue investing in him. But the other thing here is let's say he is good long-term and he's a solid option. And then you're paying Emmanuel quickly and you're paying RJ Barrett and you're paying Obi Toppin. And let's say you're paying Mitchell Robinson too. And then the Knicks are trying to make a position for a star. Their only shot just as constructed with those players and going like full youth mode with very few veterans on larger long-term deals is free agency in, in 2025 when the salary cap is expected to increase. Otherwise, they have to trade one of the players that we love. And by bringing in a player who's better than Emmanuel quickly at the point position, it's not about not believing in them. It's about trying to win now, but also then maybe leverage that player. Again, whether it's Brunson, whether it's Brogdon, whether it's anyone, right? Take your pick, just the idea of it. It's using that salary to then get you a star that you can play with all of these young players. And so it, that's the thing. It's like, it's not so much about him not being capable. 
he is a fan favorite, but so are most of the players. I mean, I've said it before, the whole thing with Obi, he's a good player, but the way that it was handled, it's like he's being treated like a folk hero because he didn't get the opportunity that he should have gotten. And I think Quick gets a little of that, but this last year's team did so much damage to the psyche of Knicks fans, which is already very fragile, right? It doesn't take a lot to get our hopes up and and yet at the same time when we get crushed, it's like, well, we should have probably expected this. And the team not being good and Tibbs playing all of these veterans, it caused so much just stress and so much second guessing and contracts seem like they're abysmal. It's just, it's a nightmare. And it's unfortunately something that we've all had to kind of deal with. And I, I'm not trying to be like, positive or optimistic for the sake of it it's more just like again we have to see the forest for the trees and so if there's a way to prioritize the young players and there is that's perfect it just doesn't mean they have to start and it doesn't mean they have to start right now down the line sure and there's a conversation that can be had at a later point of how many of these players currently on the knicks who are young who we love are going to be here when the Knicks are actually a really good team. Because we hope that they're several. Look at Boston. Look at Golden State. But at the same time, they're not the norm. Having seven guys entering the NBA Finals, playing like 20 minutes a game, and five of them are homegrown, that's absurdly high. The average, I did the math. I actually did the math. The average of teams in the last five years, that's 20 different teams. 20 different iterations of teams. I think it's like 13 organizations in, in total. The average homegrown players who are drafted by the team or like have never played with another organization except that one is three. So that means of a, a seven-man rotation, give or take, only three on average are actually quote-unquote homegrown. If you add, it's like 3.1. If you add Harden to the Rockets teams, it becomes 3.2. It's negligible. And I think that's something that we as Knicks fans also have to keep in mind, where even if the Knicks believe in these players, teams believe in stars. If these players help get them stars, then that's ideal. They actually have to accrue value. And if you throw them out um, and say, like, well, you sink or swim, there's a chance that they might swim. That'd be great, but they also might sink. And it doesn't mean it can't be recoverable, but you want to bring them along a little bit more slowly. And that, to me, is the argument regarding quickly off the bench the viewpoint of it's it's just the present and the, the near future it doesn't have to be the long-term future so um eddie that was a very long-winded way of me giving you that explanation but um i think it's i think fans just want to see the young players start i can't blame them i'd love to as well but you got to think of the long term too uh, frank corona jr if the knicks trade 11 for brogdon how do we stay positive as a fan base because i would absolutely lose my mind how do we stay positive? Well, Frank, I don't know about you, but I'm going to take a walk, go to the nearest liquor store, buy a couple handles, and just not leave my room until I make my way out of it. I don't see how there is a positive to that. Uh, it's just, I, I can't get behind that logic. I know most people can't get behind that. I, I would hope everyone cannot get behind that logic. It would be soul crushing because the other real reality of it is the Knicks spent this entire shit stain of a season trying to develop at the same time as trying to win, but not winning and also not really developing. So what did we hope for? We hope for the draft pick. The draft pick is oftentimes the light at the end of the tunnel. So if this entire season culminated in getting Malcolm Brogdon, I actually changed my mind. I think I would need something stronger than handles of alcohol. I think I would probably need to dabble in moonshine in the hopes it leaves me blind. And then I don't have to worry about the Knicks quite as much anymore. I don't know, but I'd be pretty pissed off too. Um, from all right. Andrew Claudio. We actually got two Andrew Claudio ones. Uh, here's the first one. Hi, Jeremy. First time, long time. Glad you're feeling better. And back to answer all our questions. Mine is Rangers and six, right? Right? Please. Listen. Andrew. Bubba. 
the chance in game three, it was right there. That was the chance to go up three games to none. Instead, it's 2-2. And look, I know that the Knicks are, or the Knicks, the Rangers are this team of destiny and the comeback kids and blah, blah, blah. No, 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 I don't care. Here's the simple truth. The Tampa Bay Lightning are the two-time defending champs. You can't mess around with this team. You have to go for the jugular. The Rangers didn't. They played with their food. So, no. It's going to be bolts and seven, just like it was, uh, what, five, six years ago, seven years ago, when it, I felt like my eyes were bleeding because game seven was just a miserable experience, and that should have been. No, it's going to be the lightning and seven. On to the next Andrew Claudio question. Worst experience, COVID or watching 40 Alec Burks minutes? Oh, 100% COVID. Listen, at no point during Alec Burks experience, the Alec Burks experience, did I ever feel like I couldn't breathe or swallow. Um, I, there were times where I felt like I wanted to pass out when I watched Alec Burks. But when you're sitting in, up in your bed to avoid what feels like uh, like you're ga gargling a cocktail of shattered glass and rusted nails, you'd honestly prefer Kemba Walker playing an entire game. That's how bad it truly was. Um, also, uh, Alec Burks didn't make me miss my vacation to New Orleans, which I was really looking forward to, but alas, was not able to happen. So um, Julius, on a consistent basis, there's a case for it. There is. There truly is. Uh, from Jessica Clarice Elsner. Thank you for the super chat contribution, Jessica. Someone say, uh, me, Shebarach, because your cap skills are sick. Love it. Thank you. All joking aside, I hope you're feeling better. Excited for the upcoming cap or no caps. Where is Randall most likely to get traded to? Part of that was because of COVID, but the other part was just suspense. Honestly, Jessica, I <laughs> I still feel like there is some sort of – part of me does think it is for an expiring contract in return, but, like, not a good one. Like, I'm not saying the Hawks make sense, but, like, a Gallinari type. Um, just some team that could use an extra oomph in the front court that just doesn't have it. Um, granted that's not the Hawks as currently constructed. They would have to move John Collins as well. A lot that would have to go on there, but in terms of the, the teams, I mean, I know we did a cap or no cap and I still left feeling eh, about where he would go. If you ask me right now on June 8th, I'm just looking at the list of teams that are available. The, the Bulls are an interesting option if they did the tomfoolery that had to do with Gobert. I still don't like the fit of Randall and Gobert on the offensive end, but it's it's like that sort of move where if you're the Bulls and you're already... like This would be if they lost Zach Levine, but then the math gets all wonky, so probably rule them out. Man, it just... It's still... it's It's so hard to do without thinking about the other moving pieces. Portland's obviously the easy one, but I feel like they're just, if it happens, it's not on draft night. That's the other thing. And maybe it could happen later involving the draft pick, but I feel like there's a really good chance that if there is a trade to be made, first of all, Portland's going to want to try to go after DeAndre Ayton. And you can't go after DeAndre Ayton on draft night. So then you take your chances. And if you're not able to get him, then you shift your focus. And that's when maybe this comes more realistically like are we talking about randall for bledsoe and the bucks 2025 first if they don't get jeremy grant i mean i don't i don't love it i'd need a little bit more i don't know what else it would be though portland can't really trade many of their picks because of the trade they made earlier with larry nance chicago has kind of a vice grip on their protected firsts so yeah i guess it's uh, but Portland just feels like such a lazy answer on my part. I'll go with Portland. 
Mostly because my worst nightmare is about me coughing. <laughs> and it's about to happen. Oh, God. <coughs> this is great television. <laughs> great programming, guys. All right. Um, this would be perfect if I had a co-host. But I don't. Ugh. Watch a man die on live streaming. Oh, God. Okay. Okay, I can do this. Mino F. Whew. Nope. <laughs> oh, my God. I heard John say in the pod today that he'd be surprised if Cam is back next season. Do you agree? I thought he'd be safe. I thought he'd be safe since his value is likely to decline since we traded for him, that asset management. Um, my view on Cam is pretty much if you can find a way to exploit a team like the Lakers into giving you a first-round pick in the future, do it. If you can't, hang on to it. I still get the why it was done. Uh, I still understand the fact of they didn't love... <coughs> They didn't love the Hornets pick, so they wanted to trade it into something that was a little bit more um, controllable, less volatile. Cam's not exactly rock steady, but it's the sort of thing where you at least can kind of believe that he has value that's there, that's higher than that of whatever that pick would be yielding. Um, other than that, I mean, I feel like, yeah, you... You probably want to hold on to him. You don't want to do anything rash. Um, so yeah, that's. Uh, I'd say that's. I'd keep him, but then you do have to deal with the roster logjam, even of the youth, right? Because my whole thing is you have to move two of Burks, Cam, and Fournier if you want Grimes to play, and presumably this year's pick. Um. That's harder to do. So it's, it's it's like if you're keeping Cam, that's great. But it's also <coughs> a problem. Speaking of a problem, you're going to excuse me for two minutes because I'm going to get a cough drop. One second. Ah, the beauty of live entertainment. It's wonderful, isn't it? Mm, so good. So, yes. I know, I'm sorry in, in advance, Andrew. I'm sure the audio quality of me having a cough drop is going to be great. Just stellar stuff. But, yeah. His, um, his value is better. Not right now, but it could be better. But that's the thing. You have to leverage that into something. And I think if you can find the right deal, trade them. But if you can't, hang on to them for the time being and, and go from there. Um, <laughs> <coughs> Add a bombo to Joby. Thank you for the super chat. Hashtag Jeremy flu game 27, six and six on nine of 21 shooting though. I'll take it, honestly. You know, it makes sense. Even LeBron can't get 27, 7, and 7. So uh, neither can I. But I'll I'll work with that. I'll do the best I can. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. Joshua Ford. I'm so sorry I missed your uh, comment as uh, your super chat as I guess I was dying in front of everyone. Um, do the Knicks really have the best package for number four? No, definitely not. The Knicks do not have the best package for four. In fact, I think that they have a... Generally, not great package, assuming they can't work with the third team that's also ahead of them, that's willing to move down. Um, otherwise, moving from 11 to 4, if you're Sacramento, it's not optimal. Um, I don't really know why they would do it. If you're not getting a superstar or a star. <coughs> if you're Sacramento, you're probably saying either you give us a really high amount of picks or R.J. Barrett. Um, and I just don't think the Knicks would be interested in that. 
I think the Kings would like that, but I would stay away from that. And then House Flan's question is relative to this. It's House Flan's asking, do you think a package of Grimes, Obi, and Reddish and Dallas first is enough to move up to four in this year's draft? Like, sure. I mean, if you're saying to the Kings, we're willing to restock so much of what you're doing that you could be interested. You get a lot of young players, it's something to build around. It helps them. Like Obi next to Sabonis, I think it'd be a lot of fun. Uh, Reddish gives them some more wing depth. Grimes a little bit too, although he's probably more of a guard. Um, it's easier for them. But then they'd be trading out of this pick, presumably, right? I, I think it was for four, it's supposed to, you know, adding 11 to that. <laughs> I don't think that'd be something they want. I think they're happy. Like if you can take, I guess flipping it around from our perspective, it's harder to do it. But if you're the Knicks and you could get a player like Jaden Ivey, what would it take for you to move down off of that player? Because there's nothing stopping the Kings from drafting that player and then flipping him later. <coughs> you know, maybe there's a team that's of interest down the line where you trade Ivy, like sort of what they did with um with Sabonis, where they turned Halliburton and healed into Sabonis, better fit their team. That's something. Um so I'd say probably doesn't move Sacramento, but if you included eleven, yeah, it's just it's a lot. <coughs> At least I can laugh. Hi, Jeremy. Glad you're looking and sounding healthier. I'm I guess sounding is is uh subjective, but thank you. Um uh off the back of what John and Andrew discussed earlier, what would you say the front office plan A, B, C, D is? I'd say plan A is probably trying to get the closest to star potential as you can. Um, what that is, it's, I mean, it's probably Ivy, right? If that's really, if, if the reports are true that they love him, um, then that's great. They should certainly find ways to pursue it that are where they're trading from their, their depth. Um, I guess B is, it all revolves though around bringing in someone who can run the offense. Because if you can't find someone who can bring, run the offense, it doesn't really help you. Um, so I'd say A is probably Ivy. B is Brunson. Uh, you know, I think somewhere in between all of that is moving Randall. I really do. I'd really be surprised still if he's going to be here. But who knows? Um, and then C is maybe, you know, turning the older veterans or the veterans, I guess you could say into future assets in some capacity where you eliminate the log jam. I mean, this, this all goes in a and B as well, but like, okay, you, you didn't get the chance to get Ivy. You didn't get Brunson. You need to find some sort of backup. I still, I just don't see Brogdon as that guy for reasons mentioned. Um, It's just not something that would work out there, but Maybe there's another point guard who pops up who another team is interested in. Um, I, I guess for right now, it, it's kind of a boring answer. My bold prediction is that the Knicks walk away with one of Ivy or Brunson. But I say that's bold because there's zero, <laughs> zero guarantee that they get either of them. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. And then this will... Unfortunately, be my last question, as um, as Andrew said to pull the plug, which, in his words, I'm paraphrasing, probably is a pretty apt description of what I am going through. I should let you all know this is the most I have talked in a long time. Actually, I can tell you how long it's been. It's been precisely one week since the last time where I just spitballed going through when I had a voice. So I appreciate you working with me as I work back from this really awful virus. Um, so <coughs> from Zach Smith, do you agree with John's opinion that if it happens, getting four somehow will be the defining moment of Rose's tenure, as opposed to signing a big name free agent disgruntled star. So I was actually listening to the most recent pod with uh, Andrew and John that did not have me for reasons that are 
obvious when you watch this video. And um, I, I actually disagreed with what John was saying in that this sets up the next five years. It could. Listen, he, he could be completely right about that. It's pivotal. Don't get me wrong. But there's a lot riding on this. And Leon Rose does have to take a swing. It just doesn't have to be this year. It could be next year. It could be when things are more situated for him. Um, a better opportunity arises. And then you'd hate to be in a position where maybe you move up in the draft for a player that doesn't pan out the way you think that they will. Um, and, and it doesn't work out that way. I will say that the Knicks have a better opportunity of getting a star down the line if they also move up and get a star this year, which is why even if – like. I like Jaden Ivey. I still have questions. But I can't fault the Knicks if they want to trade up for Ivey as a way of getting better, having uh, someone with star potential and raising your floor and your ceiling. And also, let's be honest, placating the fans. Um, I know fans would love that. Mixing the, the ones together, then you have a little bit more flexibility in how you could potentially trade for another star in a few years. But I don't think this is quite as significant as it could be. But as I've said before, this is, in my opinion, probably the Knicks last year in the lottery. At least we hope so. It's the last year picking 11th. They're probably picking 13th, 14th, which doesn't seem like a huge difference, but it easily could be next year. So I think that they... We'll try to do something. Obviously, they'll try to move up, but I don't. I don't think it's quite up to that level. Um. So yeah. Um. Well, all right, Lunas Amarat. I appreciate it. You might kill me, but I appreciate it, Lunas. He's got a super chat question. This will be the last one, unless other people decide to kill me with their wallets. In which case, uh, I guess. Thank you. It's obviously very appreciative. <laughs> appreciated. Uh, Luna Samarat says, one, guess on next star to want out that hasn't had rumors. Two, why does everyone think we can't top a hero offer for Don without RJ? <laughs> three, why do you hate Andrew slash our New York Rangers? Let me start with number three. I, well, first of all, I love Andrew. I love him like a, like a brother. Secondly, I also love the New York Rangers. But I've found that picking the opposing team Thus far, it's worked. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I just believe that the Tampa Bay Lightning are in a class above any other team. And they're just going to dominate. And we just have to accept that. Uh, guess on next star to want out that hasn't had rumors. I feel like every star that has less than two years of their contract is on the block. It happens like every single time, unless you're part of a team that's just absolutely dominating. Um, a star that ha we haven't heard rumors about. I'm just looking at the teams that are available right now. Um, like again, we've heard Dame rumors for eons. Uh, like, all right, you know what? I'll say it. I'll say it because I've said it before, and I'll say it now. <laughs> If we're talking about one that we haven't had any rumors about, Kevin Durant. If the Nets are falling apart, even if they sign, I, I, again, I don't think he's leaving if they're signing Kyrie. Um, but we, if you're saying no rumors, I, I haven't heard too many rumors about him potentially leaving. So uh, I'll go with him. And then why does everyone think we can we can't top a hero offer for Donovan Mitchell without RJ? I've wondered this too. Um, it's because Tyler Hero is a six man of the year award winner. Like, and I know that shouldn't necessarily be the case, but for whatever reason, being on a winning team, winning that award, it, those are the types of things that at least elevate you as an asset and quickly doesn't have that. Um, Obi's not that draft picks aren't that. Grimes isn't that, but yeah, it does feel to me as well that it's like, Hey, let's have, let's bleed the next dry because they're desperate. And yet the Miami heat can get away with highway robbery just because I, I don't, I, on one hand, I get why the heat package with hero 
is enticing. Although I would hate to be the team that next pays Tyler Hero. On the other hand, I don't get how the Knicks are supposed to be screwed over because they're desperate, but other teams like Miami, it's eh, it's totally fine. They could afford to to not do it. It doesn't make any sense. Um, from Jessica. This one is a super mom chat. Please go eat some chicken soup of some kind and rest. Thank you for doing this. Hope you feel 100% soon. Good night. It's funny. I, I felt really good the last couple of days. When you have a uh, a one-man show, that's apparently when things don't go well. Um, but I do it for the love of the game. I would do it. I, I would do this 100 times over, even if I can't breathe super well. But that's all right. That's why we're here. That's why we're talking. Um, from uh, Blood of Panta, what's the cap hit for NyQuil and a nap, Jeremy? You need rest after this all-star performance. Ah, oh, God, yeah. Well, uh, if you are a supporter of ours through Patreon, boy, do I have news for you. I will be on playback with the other gents, specifically uh, John, Andrew, and Benji. Fortunately, when I can't breathe, they will be able to continue the conversation. Um, but yeah, I would say I've been I've been off any sort of medication for a few days. It's been great. It's only when I talk about the Knicks, apparently, that it's a problem. Nothing else. Nothing else at all. But anyways, thank you all so much. Really appreciate you being here as I cough all into your ear streams, your ear canals, um, whatever you want to call it. This has been a lot of fun, uh, despite how I sound. I'm really excited to keep doing this. We've got some great programming coming up for Nick's Film School. We've got a podcast coming, I want to say on Friday, as usual. Um, and then on Saturday, we have an episode of Draft Class with Chris Persianen. He's got a really cool guest coming that you are familiar with. Certainly so, so that should be fun. And then um, on Monday, we talk about Jalen Brunson. It'll either be super healthy or Andrew will just be the greatest producer of all time. And we'll do many cuts. And just like the movies, you'll never actually know. So we'll see. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. Uh, stay safe. Stay home if you can. Test well. Um, and uh, uh, let's go Celtics because, again, I'm reverse jinxing. I got to do what I got to do. Got to get the Celtics out of there. This is what a lot of you Nets, people who rooted against them with the Nets wanted, right? I knew that the Nets weren't ever going to go this far. Knew the Celtics had the capacity in them. But no. No, it was on me for not rooting against the Nets, huh? Yeah. Look at us now. Look at where we're in. Take care.